Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Laura Lubbers and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy or CURE. And I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled The Epilepsy Autism Connection, Research, Diagnoses and Treatment. It will explore the incidence of epilepsy and autism, why epilepsy and autism are so frequently connected and the potential underlying biological mechanisms that might link the two. This webinar is a continuation of our Leaders in Epilepsy Research webinar series, where we highlight some of the critical research that's being done on epilepsy. Today's webinar is being sponsored by our friends at the Band Foundation. CURE's mission is to find a cure for epilepsy by promoting and funding patient-focused research. CURE has been instrumental for over the past 20 years by supporting groundbreaking research projects from around the world. When applicable, at the beginning of each of the webinars this year, I want to spotlight research that's being performed by one of our CURE grantees in a related area of epilepsy research. Today's spotlight features Dr. Daniel Barth, a 2016 CURE Epilepsy Award grantee. Dr. Barth and his team of investigators discovered that suspected environmental risk factors uh, for autism, such as maternal stress and certain common prenatal drugs only when combined produced autism-like behavior and epilepsy in offspring. These combinations also resulted in marked brain inflammation, a reaction of the immune system thought to contribute to both epilepsy and autism. They developed an animal model of epilepsy and autism to study the effects of combi combined environmental inflammatory factors to establish human maternal guidelines and to explore the anti-inflammatory strategies to prevent or reduce the severe neurological syndrome. For more information on this specific project or other advancements being made by CURE-funded researchers, please visit our Epilepsy News section of our website. Today's speaker is Dr. Jamie Kapal, who is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Neurology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Kapal has been an integral member of the multidisciplinary tuberous sclerosis complex clinical center of excellence and man maintains a busy uh, practice diagnosing and treating children with autism spectrum disorder and associated neurological disorders. Her current research is focused on the area of autism spectrum disorder and tuberous sclerosis complex. Before Dr. Kapal begins, I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions. You may submit your questions anytime during the presentation by typing them into the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your Zoom panel, and then click send. I also wanna thank those who already submitted questions for this webinar. We will do our best to get through as many of the questions as we can. We do ask, uh, we do want this webinar to be as interactive as possible, but to respect everyone's privacy, we ask that you make your questions general and not specific to a loved one's epilepsy or autism. I also wanna mention that today's webinar, as well as all of our previous and future webinars will be recorded and are available on the CURE website. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kamal. Thank you for having me. Um, I am going to speak about the epilepsy autism connection today. Uh, so there's a lot of things I wanna cover, but I will try my best uh, to cover as much as possible uh, on this very uh, important topic. Uh, really no relevant uh, disclosures for this uh, talk today. So my outline, um, I'm going to speak about uh, epilepsy in autism spectrum disorder, and then I'm also going to speak about the converse, autism spectrum disorder in epilepsy. Uh, then uh, I'll talk about the connection between autism and epilepsy, and then also um, discuss a little bit about autism and abnormal EEG findings. And then finally, uh, the how to evaluate epilepsy in the setting of autism spectrum disorder and future directions for research. So autism spectrum disorder, just for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the definition, is a neurodevelopmental disorder um, that affects uh, social communication and a rest uh, restrictive and repetitive interest. It's currently behaviorally defined um, by the DSM-5, 
Uh, there are many, many uh, causes for autism spectrum disorder and also uh, no one treatment that uh, treats the disorder. So uh, this, although blurry, uh, shows you a little bit about uh, some of the many comorbidities in autism. As you can see, there are difficulties with sleep and mood, um, many neuropsychiatric disorders, anxiety, uh, ADHD, aggression, uh, also intellectual disability. Uh, but what I want to show you is that seizures is one of many uh, of the comorbidities of autism. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So epilepsy, just to review the definition, is uh, characterized as a brain disorder, uh, characterized by a predisposition to generate epileptic seizures. Uh, about one in 26 people will actually develop epilepsy in their lifetime, and there are several risk factors for development of epilepsy. Uh, one of the biggest is intellectual disability, but also um, any kind of brain abnormality, so traumatic brain injury, uh, congenital malformations, uh, history of stroke. Uh, there are certain genetic mutations that uh, increase your risk for developing epilepsy, and also a history of uh, brain tumors and infections can also increase your risk of So first I want to talk about epilepsy in the setting of autism spectrum disorder. Uh, the research is uh, obtained by various methods, but overall we know that uh, there's a higher risk of developing epilepsy in the setting of autism. So uh, the roughly about one third of patients with autism can develop epilepsy, but that the research has shown anywhere from 2% to 46%. And much of that is uh, based on how they collected the data versus population data or uh, uh, research or clinic. Uh, but we do know that there is a much higher uh, percentage. We know that there's a bimodal age of onset. So epilepsy is more common in very young children and also in adolescents and young adulthood. Uh, research has shown that up to 20% of individuals with autism that are gonna develop epilepsy develop it in, in, in adulthood. Uh, there are no specific seizure types, uh, pretty much the same as, as any other type of epilepsy, and then no specific epilepsy syndrome uh, associated uh, in individuals with autism. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, the risk, the, the associated factors that may increase uh, your risk of epilepsy in the setting of autism. And uh, the, one of the big ones is age of seizure onset. Like I said, uh, as you get older, uh, your uh, risk of having uh, epilepsy in the setting of autism increases. So this is a big study that looked at four different uh, collections of, of individuals. Uh, some of them were research studies, some of them were population-based studies, parental surveys. And what this is showing is uh, the average prevalence of epilepsy. So in the younger kids, um, it, was, it was lower, but it was still at 12% with the average prevalence throughout. And then that uh, prevalence reached 26% by adolescents. So as you can see that even though um, these are collected from all different individuals, we do know that as they get older, uh, more and more individuals will uh, develop epilepsy. Uh, we also know that uh, this study also looked at intellectual disability which is another uh, risk factor that we're gonna talk about in a moment. And for every increase in your, IQ, your standard deviation in your IQ points, the odds of having epilepsy decreased by about 47%. So the other big factor is intellectual disability. And it's currently defined in, in different ways, but the, the way the, the paper defined it was an IQ of less than 70 with adaptive behavior deficit. And this paper looked at, it was a meta-analysis assessing the risk of epilepsy and autism according to intellectual functioning as well as gender. And so as you can see here, uh, as your IQ decreases, your uh, epilepsy rates increase. And uh, what they found that the pooled prevalence of epilepsy was 21.4% in, in the autistic individuals with intellectual disability versus 8% in, sub, in the autistic individuals without intellectual disability. So although we know that the, the higher your, uh, the lower your IQ is the higher risk for epilepsy, even those without intellectual disability 
at a much higher risk for developing epilepsy than um, individuals in the general population. Another associated factor is gender. So there have been uh, conflicting studies that show uh, uh, gender differences as it relates to epilepsy. So many uh, think that their females are at a increased risk for developing epilepsy versus males. So, so there's a couple studies that looked at this question. So the same uh, meta-analysis that I just spoke about also looked at gender and they did find uh, that females had a higher incidence of epilepsy compared to males. So this, the ratio, uh, when you just look at uh, individuals with epilepsy was actually closer to two to one versus uh, about three and a half to one in individuals without epilepsy. Uh, the other study that came out uh, showed that uh, looking specifically at females with intellectual disability and refractory epilepsy and showed that females with refractory epilepsy uh, were uh, more prevalent than those without refract with without treatment resistant ep epilepsy. Um, they also found that the actual severity of autism was lower. Uh, and some of the, th the theories in this paper look at uh, the thought is that that females need a much higher genetic burden in order to um, develop uh, autism. And so we see a lot more comorbid uh, neurodevelopmental conditions when you see females with epilepsy or in autism and epilepsy versus uh, males with autism uh, because they just don't need as much of a genetic load. And that theory is still um, being looked at, but it is something to think about when, when we really are thinking about the differences in gender. Other factors uh, that to think about are family history. Um, so what's, some people have seen that, that if you have a family history of epilepsy, you also, those individuals also have an increased risk of autism in other family members. So what this means is that uh, epilepsy and autism likely have common genetic factors that if you have someone in your family with one or the other, that your risk for having either one in other family members is higher. We also know that genetic syndromes, uh, like the neurodevelopmental genetic syndrome, like fragile X and tuberous sclerosis, Angelman syndrome, just to name a few, um, have higher incidences of autism, intellectual disability, and epilepsy. And so really research is focusing on these neurodevelopmental conditions to allow us to understand the underlying mechanisms of autism and epilepsy and intellectual disability that we can understand exactly how these are um, playing together and then develop uh, treatment targets. Uh, we also know that, that neurologic abnormalities can increase your risk for uh, epilepsy and autism. And then there's a lot of question about regression in epilepsy. Many people who um, come to the, the neurologist to look at uh, regression uh, think it, you know, they often will get eaten out any sort of epilepsy encephalopathy that might be causing um, autistic symptoms. Uh, the, the research is conflicting when it comes to regression. Uh, I do have a slide coming up on that in just a moment. So when we think about regression in autism, about a third of individuals with autism spectrum disorder exhibit developmental regression. Typically, that's between 18 and 24 months of age. And so people are really interested in if there is a link. And so some uh, research suggests that epilepsy is a cause of autistic regression, while other people uh, look at it as, as not a cause of regression. Um, there have been other studies that look more specifically at the um, epileptic abnormalities, not necessarily epilepsy, but just abnormalities under EEG. And uh, certain studies have found that those are more frequent in regressed children. So it's hard to know whether this is a causative thing or just an associated factor or we're biased because um, currently um, EEGs are not, you know, standard to do on everyone with autism. So are we biasing those individuals that we are actually doing EEGs on? Uh, so we don't really have a great idea of if this is something that's seen in the entire autism community or just part of the autism community. So next I want to talk a little bit about the the frequency of autism in epilepsy. Uh, so we know that, that rates of autism and epilepsy are higher. Uh, 
So these rates are anywhere from five to 37%. And again, it really is a function of, uh, you know, how you, how you run your studies and that's why the, the rates are so variable. We know that this is again, strongly associated with intellectual disability and the, the lower your IQ, the higher your risk of having autism in the setting of epilepsy. This risk has been shown to increase with a history of infantile spasm. So um, that is something that people are looking into and following out individuals with infantile spasm. Uh, certain genetic syndromes, like I said before, also have a higher prevalence of autism spectrum disorder. So important questions that uh, I was thinking about as I was making this presentation are, you know, what comes first? Uh, is it the atypical development or the epilepsy? Are there underlying brain mechanisms that predispose an individual to having both? Can we identify specific behavioral and developmental characteristics in children with autism and epilepsy, particularly in the setting of comorbid intellectual disability that provide insight into potential therapy? And also in light of epilepsy and autism, uh, both being such heterogeneous conditions, is there a distinctive AFD epilepsy phenotype and the reason I think about that is because if you think about um, both conditions, it's very hard to study both of them uh, if you just take a blanket approach. But if you take, if you look at them um, based on, you know, their comorbidities, is this specific phenotype that we can look at to develop treatments? So this uh, paper looked at, uh, it's a big prevalence study in, uh, in a Norwegian patient registry, you know, 700,000 patients. And what they found was that, you know, 11% with autism had epilepsy, and then 1% of children with epilepsy had autism. So then, you know, I think the big question, is there a causal relationship? Or are epilepsy and autism the result of the same underlying mechanism? So the way uh, I've been uh, introduced into this field and, and one of the ways that we've studied this is through our syndromic autism, uh, which syndromic autism just means autism that's also associated with epilepsy and intellectual disability. And often these have a genetic cause. And so one of my uh, specialties is studying tuberous sclerosis complex. And uh, Tuberous sclerosis has a very high prevalence of autism, epilepsy, and intellectual disability. Uh, the mechanism is very well known. Uh, these patients are often um, diagnosed prenatally or early in infancy, so it's a perfect population uh, to study uh, prospectively, which is, been a, which is a very difficult when you're when thinking about epilepsy and autism. And, and so there have been a few studies that I just want to show you uh, that that are looking at this interplay between all three uh, to really understand how they're related. Um, so, so a group out of UCLA started looking at this question several years ago. And what they did was they took 40 children with tuberous sclerosis ages three to 36 months, followed them out prospectively. 55% uh, of these patients were diagnosed with autism and 95% were diagnosed with epilepsy. And this first paper, really looks at, can we determine early on in the first year if there is anything that separates these two groups? And what they found was at six months, there were some nonverbal delays uh, in development. So in fine motor and visual spatial skills in these kids that eventually went on to be diagnosed with autism. And by nine months, the kids with autism actually had delays in all areas of development. Uh, so. Uh, the same group uh, has looked at not just development, but also looked at, um, you know, the, the differences between tuberous sclerosis in the setting of autism and autism, you know, for other causes. And I didn't have enough time to show you all that, but what they found was that a lot of the symptom profiles are the same. And so this is another reason that tuberous sclerosis and potentially other single gene disorders uh, are great ways to study the development of autism and how it affects the brain because we're, they're very similar in um, their clinical presentation. So 
So uh, the same uh, patient cohort, basically what, what she found was that by 12 months of age, the children that were later diagnosed with autism demonstrated significantly greater cognitive delays and declines in their IQs from 12 to 36 months. And this was done on the Mullen scales of early learning. But as you can see that those who um, developed autism uh, really pulled further and further behind their peers um, compared to those who did not develop. And so uh, a group that I've been particularly involved with, and this was the paper that we put out a couple of years ago, was really looking at the, uh, the effect of seizures on development in this group of individuals. And so what I'm showing you here is the Mullen Scales of Early Learning, which is a developmental scale for young children. And at the top, uh, this is, well, so this is a multidisciplinary study um, from five centers across the US, really looking at uh, a prospective study from infants, you know, from birth to 36 months, looking at developmental testing, um, imaging, and uh, high resolution EEG to determine, you know, if there are things that we can learn about the development of autism in this group of individuals, and then look back and say, is there a biomarker? Uh, so this is just really looking at the development and how seizures affect that. So in the red uh, are the seizure patients with seizures, and in the green are the patients that did not have seizures. And as you can see, at six months, they're relatively similar, um, starting to pull away. But as you as you go through 12, 18, and then 24 months, the individuals with seizures really do lag behind in their overall development compared to individuals who have never had a history of seizures. And in the bottom, um, you can see that the middle line is everybody and then we split them apart according to who had seizures and who did not. Um, and this, what we graphed was the early learning composite score, which is a kind of a total cognitive score from the Mullen scale. But uh, all of the subdomains of the Mullen, which is you know the fine and the, the fine motor and um, visual reception and expressive and receptive language, all showed similar um, relationships in individuals with seizures versus no seizures. We looked also at um, infantile spasms, history of infantile spasms, the frequency of seizures, uh, and the same uh, relationship was found uh, through all of them. Uh, one of the things that I didn't show you was that even seizures, having seizures early on, so the earlier you have seizures, the worse it affects your development. Um, and then the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, how that affected uh, autism symptoms. So in this slide, uh, we looked at uh, two separate assessments, uh, objective assessments looking at autism features. One was the autism uh, you know, scale for infants at 12 months, and the other one was the ADOS, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule at 24 months. And what we found were that, that people with seizures, or the babies with seizures, showed much higher characteristics of autism, autism behaviors um, even as early as 12 months compared to those who had never had a history of seizures. This was also the case for infantile spasms and also the case for higher seizure frequency. Uh, we are currently doing analyses on um, a more detailed look at seizures and how uh, they temporarily relate to development um, and actual diagnosis of autism. We, could, we, felt we carried this out to 36 months to see if this relationship holds true. Uh, and that data is still currently um, being analyzed now, but still um, that, that relationship is very robust. And so when we, you know, the question is, is are there converging pathways to all three of these? Uh, we think about common processes that underlie epilepsy and autism. And so some theories about, you know, overexcitable brains um, having, you know, the, the imbalance between um, inhibition and excitation. Uh, we also know that some epilepsy, uh, the genetic epilepsies, impact synaptic plasticity and connections, uh, you know, cortical connectivity, which can in turn, you know, predispose the early developing brain to uh, developmental delays and abnormal uh, development in their connectivity, which could eventually potentially lead to autism. Um, again, I, you know, I keep stressing this: the, the genetic underlying, you know, underlying genetic syndromes really, uh, especially in autism, can under, can affect neuronal synapses, and that can also predispose you to 
to um, having epilepsy. So it's, it's very difficult, I think, to, to really try to figure out, you know, what comes first. I think all of these things are very interwoven. Uh, and so when we think about treatments, we are really trying to think about treatments for everything and, and not just for, for one. And, and ideally, if we found one, then maybe that treatment will affect the other, the other aspects. And so uh, something I became interested in uh, a while ago and, and, and uh, published a few years ago was looking at the epileptiform EEGs in autism. And even not just epileptiform EEGs, it's even just abnormal, so flowing and things like that. Uh, we know that epileptiform discharges are seen in up to 60% of patients with autism in the absence of ever having a seizure, at least in the studies that we know. A lot of this was done cross-sectionally and not necessarily followed longitudinally. But the questions that I think about are, you know, are these EEG abnormalities predictive of developing epilepsy? Um, are they indicative of worse behaviors or development? Uh, do they have impact the core features of autism? Uh, what is the significance of these abnormal EEGs in autism? Or is it just really reflecting a disorganized brain? Um, the, the studies that, that have been done really may look at things uh, either just in a cross-sectional manner uh, there have been a, a, one or two studies that looked at, followed people out prospectively looking at uh, those who had epileptiform EEGs. And, you know, they, as, as they kind of came, you know, um, as they followed them out uh, through the years, uh, much higher percentages of those people developed epilepsy. So that's a question that, that you know, we think about. Is there, is there like a biomarker that we can think about who's going to develop this? Uh, but as I stated earlier, uh, we don't do EEGs uh, as a standard um, for, in, for everyone with autism. So uh, it's really kind of a biased sample when we think about it uh, with who we're, you know, uh, collecting EEG data on with these patients. So the paper that, that my group published um, in 2018 is we really, I, I uh, looked at all, the patients that we had diagnosed with autism uh, in our developmental and behavioral pediatric division, and uh, we had 443 patients. And I really focused on the ones that uh, had histories of seizures uh, you know, or and or EEGs. And so uh, we had, uh, and I really looked at them at the time that they were diagnosed with autism, and not necessarily uh, if they developed epilepsy later, just at, just at the time of their diagnosis. So at the time of diagnosis, about 16% of these patients had uh, epilepsy, and about 25% of them had abnormal EEGs and never having had a seizure. And what I found was that uh, children with autism and these abnormal EEGs uh, actually looked more similar to those with epilepsy than those with normal EEG results in the settings of you know, adaptive behavior uh, and the presence, you know, of these abnormalities or epilepsy in the setting of a ASD can suggest maybe some uh, worse developmental functioning. Now, this was, you know, very preliminary, and this is a retrospective study, but it really makes you think about, um, you know, where to put these abnormal EEG patients. Are they, uh, you know, if they are more closely aligned with those with epilepsy, what can we learn from them, or what should we be doing something to these patients? Um, to somehow prevent it or at least follow them out, uh, you know, clinically uh, to see, you know, do they, do they eventually uh, develop epilepsy or, you know, do their behaviors change and, and things like that. Uh, right, there really isn't a consensus currently, but I think it's just definitely something we need to look at. And so when we think about uh, conceptualizing this relationship, there's three different ways you can think about it. One, you can, you know, on the, uh, in the green, thinking, okay, there's one etiology and it's going to impact, you know, everything. So intellectual function, uh, the risk for developing autism, epilepsy, um, abnormalities on your EEG. Um, then you have your causative model where you have a etiology that causes epilepsy that causes ASD. So when you think about your epileptic encephalopathies are probably uh, in this, that they directly cause one another. 
but then, you know, in the pink, you think about, okay, you have this etiology and then it could develop epilepsy or, um, you know, ASD or intellectual disability. And then one of those in turn affects the relationship of the other. And so it's definitely more of a, a dynamic relationship, which is kind of the way I think about, uh, about it just currently, because, you know, there are certain genetic conditions that could result in either one or both, um, but sometimes maybe epilepsy comes first or autism or intellectual or disability or developmental delay comes first, and then they can negatively impact um, the other systems. And so when we think about studying these and doing research, we really have to think about how, how these uh, relate to each other uh, because it really is not a linear uh, relationship. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to try to, to tease apart what causes what and then in turn develop therapies. And so then when we think about how we evaluate epilepsy in the setting of autism, and there really isn't a consensus on how to do this uh, specifically in individuals with autism. At this point, it's the same as in individuals without autism. Um, however, uh, you know, the physicians should have a high index of suspicion and counsel their patients on what to look for uh, because we do know that the risk of having seizures is higher. Uh, videos are helpful because often, you know, stereotypic behaviors and things like that in autism or sharing are, are difficult to, uh, to tease apart, especially to someone who doesn't quite know what they're looking for. So having videos I find is helpful. Um, talked a little bit about EEGs before. So, you know, the question is, is, do you screen with an EEG in the absence of suspicion for seizure? Uh, at this point, we don't, because there isn't enough evidence to support doing this. Um, and so at this point, we only use EEG if there is a clinical concern for seizure. And then if EEG is necessary, it is preferable to do an overnight EEG to capture sleep, because we know that we are missing a lot of abnormalities if we are just collecting um, data during the week. Uh, Anti-seizure medications should really be tailored individually to the seizure type and the individual uh, patient factors. There really is no specific uh, anti-seizure uh, treatment just for kids with autism. And then genetic testing is becoming more and more highly recommended due to these shared mechanisms. So, you know, a microarray is a great place to start. Uh, there are definitely uh, more panels that are coming out uh, that, that look for genes that are shared between autism and intellectual disability and epilepsy, and so those are also things to think about um, because we know that, that these kids are having, are more likely to have genetic causes. And then finally, just thinking about future directions, um, you know, figuring out ways to distinguish which individuals with autism will go on to develop epilepsy may help us to prevent it or maybe recognize it sooner and treat sooner. Um, and also by studying these genetic disorders with high rates of autism, epilepsy, and intellectual disability, we want to understand the different biologic pathways that are associated with these three things in order to develop you know, preventative and ameliorative treatments. So with that, um, I'm happy to uh, take questions. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Kapal. So we'll now begin the Q&A session. Again, if you have questions, uh, please submit them in the Q&A tab located at the bottom of the Zoom panel. I know we've got a number of questions already. Uh, click that send and we will get them uh, and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Uh, so one question that I have is you shared a lot of information about tuber sclerosis complex. So can you talk about the information that we've gathered there and how that might translate to other neurodevelopmental disorders? How do we do that? That's a great question. And I think that's uh, why. So currently, um, well, so what we've learned is that, um, you know, early on, the earlier your brain gets disrupted, so that can be seizures, for example, that, that those other pathways, so intellectual disability, autism, those things you're at a much higher risk um, for overall uh, disorganization of the brain by having seizures early on. And so what we're trying to figure out is, are there other things that can tell us um, 
what else is going on from a, from a structural standpoint, from an EEG standpoint, uh, because the goal is prevention. And so there are studies going on now, uh, the, the, something called the PREVENT trial, looking at early seizure treatment in babies with tuberous sclerosis that have not had seizures yet, but just have abnormalities in their EEG. If you treat that before the seizures come, will you get better results with development uh, and maybe better results as far as uh, uh, preventing autism? And so that study just is closing right now. So we are, are very anxious to find out the results because really that's the next step. And so many other neurodevelopmental disorders are also looking at similar things. And what we know is that looking earlier is better. Uh, the earliest that we can try to, to uh, advocate for prevention, the, the better off we are to disrupt these uh, mechanisms that result in developmental delays and autism. Perfect, thank you. Um, along the similar lines, you mentioned that EEG is not uh, standard screening. Correct. Uh, with autism. What sort of information would need to be gathered in order to make that more uh, standardized approach? I think what we really need is a prospective studies, basically uh, doing screening EEGs on all kids that are newly diagnosed with autism and then following them out longitudinally. Uh, the problem is, is that's a very you know, extensive and long study, but I really think it's something that needs to be done so that we have a, an, a, a true idea of what, of what the percentage of kids with autism that would have abnormal EEGs and what is their risk of eventually developing epilepsy? Uh, that will give us the evidence we need to say everybody with autism needs to get an EEG as screening. Right now, we just don't have that information. Okay, great, thank you. So another question that's come in, is there a relationship between the level or type of autism um, with a particular, particular seizure focus in those with focal epilepsy? So if there's, epilepsy emanating from a specific area of the brain, or that, is that person more likely to develop autism or associated? So a lot of people have looked at this, and um, people, so there's some evidence showing that maybe epilepsy in the frontal region of the brain or the temporal region of the brain may pre predispose you to having autism, um, but it's not, uh, it's not universal. It's just there's some evidence showing. So you sort of touched on this with the PREVENT trial and a way to look at it, but is there evidence that autistic children can improve cognitively with increased seizure control? Has anybody looked at that? We are currently looking at that. Uh, as far as uh, with, the, with the young, with the same study that was looking at the natural history of development of autism, we are actually collecting all the seizure diaries and we are actually going to look at treatment um, to see if anyone's scores improved with treatment. Uh, there's also a group looking at uh, the benefit of epilepsy surgery because uh, to see if that, uh, by improving seizures, uh, increased development. The, uh, again, the goal though is to look early because um, if you were to look at a 10 year old, you know, all of those, those, mech the, you know, those brain, uh, the development, the early development in the brain has kind of been set. And so you really have to focus on the young, young children. And so that, that is where the field is going right now. Um, and so now we're just, uh, there's no, there's nothing that's come out of it yet, but that's where we're looking. Okay. Okay. Um, similar, just your, your thoughts on this. Um, we know that epilepsy can impact cognitive function and can cause cognitive de decline in a way that might make an adult look like they have some aspects of autism. Is this due to the seizure activity or is there, is there a way to protect the brain from that seizure activity? And then that's a that's a difficult question, I think, to answer because, yes, when you think about uh, the epileptic encephalopathies, for example, so those are the patients who are having lots and lots of seizures. And even when they're not having seizures, their uh, background brain activity is abnormal. And so really those, those connections are not allowed to, to form correctly. And so you're really getting a lot of 
cognitive impairment because of that. Um, and so in those cases, by controlling the seizures, you would expect that the uh, cognition would improve uh, in those cases. Uh, in other cases, though, when it's not that way, it's less clear that I think, again, you have to sort of think about the epilepsy is not causing it. It's just maybe two things are happening simultaneously and epilepsy is just making it worse. So epilepsy, you know, treating the epilepsy may help, but it's not going to reverse it. Um, another question. Um, so are there links between epilepsy, autism, and Alzheimer's? That's a great question. And I, I know, I can't say that I know a lot about the literature with Alzheimer's, but I can say that there are, there's a lot of interest in looking at the connection between Alzheimer's and autism because I think there are a lot of genetic, uh, shared genetic mechanisms there. Um, and that is definitely something um, that, that I think needs to continue to be looked at as we do more genetic studies to look at what are the shared genetic links between individuals with Alzheimer's and autism. But yeah, I think there's a lot of, they found that there's a lot of similar similarities in the in the connectivity of the brain in both of those disorders. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question. Many people with epilepsy, including those with autism, are not responsive to medications and anti-epileptics can cause disturbing side effects. Mood, GI, anxiety, increased uh, repetitive behaviors that worsen um, what are your thoughts about the VNS and more specifically non-invasive VNS that is not approved in the U.S. as yet? Does it have with autistic behaviors at all? I think it's this, uh, you know, I like VNS. I think that there are um, some folks that it works very well with. I think I had one patient, for example, who I was thinking about doing a VNS on, but because his, uh, he was so active and his behaviors were so, uh, erratic that that he really wasn't deemed a good candidate for it. Uh, but I do have other folks who, um, another individual I'm thinking of, that really did well with VNS because this individual was having so many negative side effects with all of the anti-seizure medications and really, really couldn't um, find a good balance with medication. So I think, you know, it's definitely an option um, uh, with individuals with ASD for sure. Um, back to sort of the question around focal epilepsy, and this is more directed to TS. Okay. Um, are there any neuroanatomical relationships between tuber location and the development of autism epilepsy or both? Yeah, they've, they've been looking at that. Um, there have been a couple papers that have mentioned, um, I want to say again, like frontal and temporal, uh, but nothing uh, that's absolute. I know that... Uh, Part of this study that, that I'm part of is we are doing high detailed MRI studies looking at where the tubers are, what the burden is, um, but we don't, have a, we don't have a definitive answer for that yet. Okay, okay. Yes, the follow-up to this question is, is there a relationship between tuber load? So it sounds yeah. like that's being studied. Yeah, it's kind of indirectly. Uh, the, the, uh, there's a paper that, if it hasn't come out yet, it will be, looking at the connection between seizure severity and tuber load and development, and there's sort of an indirect relationship between tuber load. Okay, interesting. Uh, a question, a more general question, should all children diagnosed with epilepsy, especially learning disabilities, be screened for autism? Yeah, I mean, ideally, yes. So in the general pediatrics world, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics has set up guidelines to screen uh, their young patients for autism and with uh, the M test, which is just a questionnaire uh, that you get, I think, 18 months, 24 months, and then again, somewhere between uh, two and three uh, to, to screen for autism. So we're getting better at that uh, because one of the problems is, is that when in young individuals were getting diagnosed with epilepsy, they kind of 
the, the other aspects of their development weren't really paid attention to as much. So they were finding that those individuals were getting diagnosed with autism much later uh, because maybe they were spending more time really focused on the seizures. So yes, those, those folks really should have, uh, you know, good surveillance by their pediatrician. Uh, and if there are any concerns for development or anything, they should be referred on to a developmental pediatrician uh, for further workup. Okay, so this is really a place where parents could be advocating for that. Very much so. Okay, terrific. Um, so what, another question, what evaluations are being done outside of the brain and EEG? Uh, are people looking at the gut, the autonomic nervous system, um, sleep disruption uh, that are implicated in both epilepsy and autism? Uh, yes, I mean, there are definitely folks that are looking at the, the gut uh, brain connection. I think there's a lot of interest there, uh, especially those, again, it's almost like these subtypes of autism, the, like EEG is one, and then the patients that have a lot of GI disturbances uh, are another group. The, I think sleep can be uh, disrupted for many reasons and kind of overlaps with a lot of these groups. Uh, there's an autoimmune uh, interest in individuals that potentially have an autoimmune component to their autism, which I do, again, think is a, another sort of subtype uh, that, that is worth studying. Um, so I think, uh, you know, at, the more we learn about the underlying cause, then we're better able to study the clinical features, because right now we just, uh, ha or historically, have been looking at autism as a set of symptoms. Uh, but if you study autism just as the symptoms and you have, you know, hundreds of causes behind it, you're not really going to learn anything until you really get at what is the cause. So, yeah, there's lots of interest in these different areas. Right, right. Great point. Uh, there was a question about what kind of preventative treatments would be given to a person with autism and abnormal EEGs, but it sounds like we really need to understand the biology. Correct. We don't know. Uh, I know that people have been interested, you know, and maybe uh, there have been some small studies that have put kids with abnormal EGs on Epicote, for example, um, and really haven't found uh, a lot of benefit uh, for, you know, the interest is like, do you, do you put them on medicine to prevent epilepsy? Do you put them on medicine to improve their EEG? Uh, we don't know, I, because I, I think was, the reason why people are interested, too, is looking at um, you know, benign Rolandic epilepsy, for example, those individuals may have a few seizures, but they have a lot of underlying EEG abnormalities when they're sleeping. And some groups found that if you treat the EEG, it may improve their cognition. So the same thought uh, is in this group, but, but we, nobody's actually done a big enough study to, to tell us, is, is that actually worth it? Or does it do anything? Um, so that question is still very controversial. And I, Nobody is really studying it right now, so it definitely needs to be studied. Okay. Um, another question that's come in. Um, it can be very difficult to get a non-sedated EEG on many children with, with autism due to sensory and other issues, especially and overnight. Yes. Are there other ways to, um, to detect EEGs with headband, um, a different uh, non-traditional approaches? to EEG um, uh, 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 measurements uh, and what their relative accuracy is? Are people trying different approaches? Um, I know that in certain uh, research world that they're using the CAP, the EEG CAP. Mm -hmm. And um, I know one group, uh, what they've done is they actually desensitized the children uh, by having them wear hats. And so they got used to it. And so then when you put the cap on, they're already kind of used to that feeling. And those EEGs are actually pretty accurate versus the traditional, you know, the in, you know, putting on the leads individually. Um, now, a lot of times I know in my institution, we don't do that clinically. There's a lot of, I'm sure a lot of reasons that, you know, financially and, and uh, training wise, but I know in research to really get all of these children to get uh, EEGs, they become very creative at, at desensitizing the kids. And so, uh, you know, all of our studies, we, we, do, we do EEGs on all of our kids and uh, um, are actually pretty successful. So they're, yeah, they, these big technology companies have come up with very creative ways to get the information. Terrific, that's great to know. Uh, 
that the technology continues to try to improve and, and keep up with this issue. Yes. We've got one more question. Okay. Um, what's involved with genetic testing and where can we direct people for more information? Yes. So genetic testing can be done several ways. Um, Typically uh, and historically, it's been a blood test, and uh, you can your uh, neurologist or developmental pediatrician can order it. Typically, what we do is a, a chromosomal microarray, which looks at any deletions or duplications in your genes. It's a good place to start. There are many companies that have developed these genetic panels, which can be done by blood or saliva, uh, that look at uh, each panel is different and geared toward a certain set of genes that they're looking at, but there's a autism intellectual disability panel, for example. There's an epilepsy, lots of epilepsy panels. Um, and so those are targeted testing. And then you have the bigger whole exome sequencing, which uh, currently the Simons Foundation has a big study going on throughout the country called the SPARC study. And that is collecting saliva from the patient and both parents and, and looking at their exomes to really understand the genetic underpinnings of autism. And so you could even go to the Simon Foundation and look up Spark study and you can get a kit mailed to your house. So that's a great way to get some genetic information that's free for the families because often genetics are not covered by insurance. Uh, they're getting better at uh, covering them for neurodevelopmental conditions, but still not great. Okay, well that's terrific advice. Uh, and, we, and certainly uh, we can make that information available as well. So with that, I would like to thank you, Dr. Kapal, for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, I think it was a great interactive uh, presentation and, and Q&A session. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Band Foundation for sponsoring today's webinar and our entire webinar series. Uh, and I'd like to thank the audience today uh, for uh, participating, uh, for, for forwarding such great questions. If you have additional questions about this topic uh, or wish to learn more about any of CURE's research programs, uh, please visit our website at cureepilepsy.org. And please also be sure to register for our next uh, Leader in, Leaders in Epilepsy webinar series, or uh, webinar, uh, which is on May 14th. It's at 2 p.m. Central Time. And in that webinar, Dr. Zach Greenspan will discuss the role of epilepsy learning healthcare systems and their potential impact on the epilepsy community. So with that, I wanna thank you all and please be safe, be well.